Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. I love prayer. I love what prayer does. I love the impact of prayer. I love the, um, the nature of prayer. And, e- and when I'm not going through it, I love the arduousness of prayer. <laughs> Usually that's in retrospect. Where I look back and go, wow, am I glad I prayed. <laughs> Although during those moments where it's difficult, and all of us that pray know the times of difficulty, um, it's not always that comfortable, and you're not always that confident that God is really doing something. That's kind of what I want to talk to you about today, how God does things without us even knowing it as we pray, as we pray. I want to read to you something I actually have taken from, uh, to begin, I want to read this. I've taken it from a course that I wrote called Prayer and Spiritual Warfare. It's a 300-page course, uh, over 300 pages in, in outline form. It takes about 28 hours to go through it. And uh, it's actually online, but uh, you, so if, you, if you've taken that course online, you will have heard me read this part, but I'll, I, I want to read it because I think it succinctly sums up where I come from in prayer. So before I read this, I want to pray. Father, in the name of your Son, I ask you to allow me to speak that which is upon your heart. And allow me to say it in such a way that touches people, individuals, and encourages them to continue prayer. I ask you to do this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I believe that prayer is in some way or at some level spiritual warfare. It destroys evil. Anything that destroys evil, I think, is a form of spiritual warfare. Now, it may not be the way many think, but whatever you think, at some level, it will destroy evil. It brings light into darkness, and it implements God's kingdom into the natural world from the spiritual world. With that understanding, prayer is still a mystery. This observation is not meant to suggest that the mystery of prayer is incomprehensible or that the various problems concerning prayer are inexplicable. It's that every prayer is not only a power, every prayer is a force, an invisible force that affects and impacts and changes things that one normally does not see. The force of prayer lies not in how much we pray, nor in vain repetitions of prayer. It's in how much our prayers are in accordance with God's principles of prayer. Prayer does not alter that which God has determined. After all, he is sovereign. In that respect, prayer is meant to achieve what God has already purposed or foreordained. Prayerlessness, though, does And I repeat that, prayerlessness does effect change because God will allow many of his resolutions to be placed on hold due to the lack of prayerful cooperation between man and him. So he lets them sit there until someone prays because he won't violate the will of man. A serious error concerning prayer prevails in our common understanding, which is to say that we often think of prayers as an outlet for expressing what we need. It's as if our cry to God for help is, help me, help me. What we do not recognize is that the highest form of prayer is not in the prayer that says, help me. It's in the prayer that asks God to fulfill his desires rather than ours. We ought to understand that God's original thought is certainly not him letting believers achieve their own aims through prayer. Rather, it is God accomplishing his purposes through the prayer of those believers. Thus, it's not God seeking man's advice. It's God allowing us through prayer to touch the omniscience we do not have. 
This is not meant to imply that Christians should never ask the Lord to supply their needs. That's clear that there are times we need to do that. It only is meant to indicate we need to first understand the meaning and principles of prayer so that when we pray, we pray with the unknown in mind. We don't have to know the impact of our prayer. We do have to believe that prayer will have impact. I am here today because people prayed and they probably had no clue they were praying for me. But when they prayed, your will be done. God says, okay, part of my will is for John Paul Jackson to do this. You didn't discriminate on how that will has to be parceled. So we pray with kind of an unknowing, and it's in this cloud of unknowing that we come to realize God was acting all the while we did not know it. Again, our prayer is on one level or another spiritual warfare as we ask God to overthrow Satan's plan and to implement his, and Satan will always try to stop. And if he can't stop, discourage all such prayer. Prayer is not simply an activity we do, it is weakness leaning on omnipotence. It is recognizing our inadequacy and believing an all-powerful God actually wants to listen and act on our behalf. Leonard Ravenhill once said, a man who is intimate with God will never be intimidated by men. When you live in a world governed by so much intimidation, this is a good thing to know. In prayer, we shift the center of living from self-consciousness to self-surrender. Without fully realizing it, prayer is an act of self-purification, and it starts by the quarantine of our soul. What we want to do, we stop doing. What we want to think, we learn to regulate. What we want to analyze, we hold in suspension. Herein, we find the first form of spiritual warfare beginning inside of us, it is me conquering me. And I cannot do it without God's help. True prayer taps into the presence of the one who you know without question holds the answers to all your questions and furthermore knows the answers to the questions you don't even know you're supposed to ask yet. Prayer parts to see of opposing circumstances. William Temple said it well. When I pray, coincidences happen. And when I don't pray, they don't. <laughs> prayer is the essence, then, of spiritual living. When we, are in the, when we are the full focus of prayer, it becomes a drive that skirts the edge of that which is beyond our belief and understanding. Prayer is our attachment to the utmost, and it keeps God in sight and even brings him near. Prayer makes the prayer relative to the sublime and initiates the prayer into divinum mysterium, or the mystery of everything that God created. In prayer, we dwell on the edge of eternity and mystery, yet we don't often know it. Instead, in our unknowing, we ignore it and we even ignore the possibility it's there. There's a Hebrew word, kavanah. Kavanah is a prayer referred to which generally is translated as concentration or intent, but it's much deeper than that. The introductory measure of kavanah is an awareness that we often speak to God, and therefore, when we speak to God, we ought to make him the fullness of our focus. Speaking to God, therefore, takes on the obligation to cast aside distractions that keep us from having focused attention on him. We should never let a lower thought overtake the thought of a higher order. That's the idea of Kavanaugh. Disciplining ourselves so that we never allow the lower to take over the higher. The Hebrew understanding of this prayer without, is this, without kavanah is like a body without a soul, without a body without passion, without body without insight or understanding. 
This attitude is meant to take one deeper into prayer by yielding the focus of our mind to God. It's the total disregard of our personal desires. It is the absence of self-centered thought. The truth is, only God can grant this Kavanaugh. It's not something you can make yourself have. None of us are disciplined enough or spiritual enough to make it happen. But if we seek him, that eschacy can happen. At the same time, it cannot happen if we don't seek him. Desire then prods the will of man to pray. The prodded will then opens a door for prayer, but what enters that door is not always so much prayer. What enters that door is the future. The future that will happen because we prayed. And the future that won't happen if we don't. In prayer, we come close to hearing the eternal theme of the kingdom of God, which allows us to, ge to generate a greater perception of our place in that kingdom. Through prayer, our life in God becomes more a seamless garment, inextricably interwoven with the infinite. It is here our property becomes his property, and his property becomes ours. And we gladly exchange our will for his wisdom. There is a mystery to the design of prayer. God seeks out a person to pray, and if he does not find that person, he will not act. I looked for a man to stand on the gap and could not find one. And in that case, Israel suffered because of that vacuum. The main point of prayer then is to allow God to be justified in taking action over the will of man making our will his will. The privilege of praying is man's greatest distinction from every other one of God's creations. No other faculty, nothing of God that God created has that capacity to pray but man. Perhaps that's why we were given authority over the earth. We have neglected that as well. Sadly, man has erected a wall between him and God. And when we hit that wall, we either pray or we decay. Without prayer, that wall thickens and the wall grows higher. And soon, the wall of our own making will topple from its own height and crush us. And it's in that crisis we pray. Too often, crisis then becomes the impetus for prayer. Still, there's a far higher entrance to prayer than through deep despair or sorrow or crisis. There's a place of divine life we can pray from. And that entrance is only available as we open our thoughts towards God. Prayer is our humble answer to the inconceivable surprise that God loves us. Prayer is what we offer in return for the mystery of the divine by which we are given life. If God is light, then without prayer, we will eventually experience spiritual blackouts. And as well, those spiritual blackouts will often come from the walls that we have erected. God desires to do good for man. And we've moved past the dark night of the soul and have become entangled in the dark night of society. Only the kingdom of God can enlighten this darkness. And only God can say, let there be light. And there will be light enough to break through the prideful self-sufficiency of man. To pray is to seek the one who lives to make intercession for us. In this light, to pray is in itself a prayer to know how to pray better. To not want to pray is then the sin behind the sin of not praying. And with it, in, with it ends the ability to pray. To not be able to pray becomes its own inherent punishment. It is our prayer, if our prayer is to reach and move God, it can only happen because he first moved us to pray. Prayer draws us closer to God, and in coming closer we discern the body, and we discern the holy from the profane in the body. Not to pray, then, is to lose the ability to discern the things that really matter. 
To lose discernment is to become spiritually dull to the powers that are making every effort to rule us, to distract us, to deceive us. This dullness always results in spiritual apathy, and our strength to pray becomes weaker and more fragile. If prayer truly changes things, then to not pray is to see nothing change, which becomes a great injustice to people, because that which could have been changed remains unchanged, and the first person damaged by the absence of this is us. If the will of God for, uh, for man is to pray, and it is, then to pray thy will be done must be a prerequisite for his will to be done. The final conclusion of prayer is that the Father may be glorified, and every prayer we pray should end with that result in mind that the end result will glorify the Father. Thus, the result of answered prayer will be the glorification of the Father. And as Jesus said, I do nothing that the Father does not do. I do not seek my own honor, but I seek the honor of the one who sent me. Seeking that which brings us glory is not the same as seeking that which will bring God glory. The mature intercessor will know how to navigate this terrain. The novice will struggle for a little while, yet it's this very struggle that will increase their ability to enter into the deeper forms of prayer. Without this interior conflict, the warrior will always remain the servant of his or her own soul. Perhaps this is why the Holy Spirit desires to pray through us, so we are assured at some point we actually pray the will of the Father. Prayer is in its simplest form, beseeching a sovereign God to be sovereign. And in his action or inaction, God is always telling us something. It's through prayer we learn what that something might be. That's where I come from in prayer. That's what drives me. I think it's what drove my father, my mother. I think it's what drove my family members, my grandfather. I'm a fifth generation Christian. I'm glad of that. Daniel 9. Daniel 9 is probably the backbone of most intercessory prayer groups. Yes, John 17. Yes, Matthew 6. And the apostolic prayers. But Daniel 9 always kind of kicks into gear when we talk about praying. But I'm not sure everyone understands what Daniel 9 was really all about. Daniel 9 was, was a rare combination of two things that happened. A man by the name of Jeremiah giving a prophetic word and his servant Baruch writing that down. And then a man named Daniel coming along subsequently and believing that prophecy. One of the things that stirs intercession and keeps intercession going is an accurate prophetic word. When I began ministry, shortly after I began ministry, I... I, was going to church and became a, a, a part of a non-paid staff member at uh, a place called Church on the Rock with Larry Lee. Larry went into great amounts of prayer, and he, he, he has prophetically been said that he will go down as one of the men who changed the face of the church concerning prayer. He wrote a book called Could You Not Tarry One Hour, and he coined a, a, a model of prayer that still works today, I believe. Now, model of prayer basically is this. You take the stops of the, the uh, like a jogging trail. You, you, go to, you come to stops and you stretch and you, you elongate your muscles. Uh, you keep them from pulling on you, especially when you get to be my age. And you, you uh, then think about what's going on and how you're doing. Measure, you know, how fast did I run that part of the, of the trail and so on. Well, he, he coined this, this, this uh, the idea, the concept of this, that when we jog, we take the Lord's Prayer and we treat it like that. And so he broke down the Lord's Prayer into certain topics. And he would say, like, our Father, who art in heaven. So you would go, wait a minute, our Father. He's not, can, can I make him, does that our mean my personal Father? 
And it is. You can personalize that. It's like in a family. My brother and I have a brother and two sisters. We ha- our father passed away, but we had a father. And he was our father, but he was also my father. Being our father didn't negate he was my father. And so you, you personalize God. So many times we, we, we think of God as an impersonal God, but we need to personalize him. And so we, we take this prayer journey. We, we take, take it, and Larry developed it to the point where that it took an hour to go through the, all of the Lord's Prayer. So our Father, and you define that. Who art in heaven? Well, it's not Sheol. That's not Haiti, so heaven. You know, where is that? And what does that mean? It's the heaven above all heavens. Not just heaven. It is the heaven above all heavens. Who art in heaven? Hallowed be your name. So hallowed, revered, honored, to be lifted up, to, to be placed higher than me. Your name. And by the way, the word name is not, is not singular. It's plural. So that, so that it is, what are all the names of God? This, plural, this one God who has so many facets, so many aspects to him. He is Jehovah Shama, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Makedesh, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah, Jehovah Rohi, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Yireh. What are all these? And so you start understanding he is the God who sanctifies. He is the God who of my righteousness. He is the God who is always there. He is the God who heals me. He is the God who provides for me. So you start understanding these names and you take a moment at as you jog along the prayer trail to think about what this means and apply it to your life great devotional prayer life then the lord had me go and uh, i met mike mike bickle and i i moved to be to kansas city i was with mike bickle for five years and the, saw the church grow saw larry, larry lee's church we were praying with about six men and an insurance office And three years later, it was 9,000 people. And 500 people were gathering at 6 o'clock every morning, 34 miles outside of Dallas. Before they even went to work, people would drive an hour to an hour and a half for a 6 o'clock in the morning prayer meeting. And then drive into Dallas another hour in the traffic. And they loved it. They loved it. How does this happen? Something God did. Something he touched the heart of a man and it touched the heart of men. Incredible things. And the church grew to 9,000. When I joined, when I joined with Mike in Kansas City, Kansas City Fellowship was like 200 people. And we just bought this, this, high, this uh, indoor soccer arena. That was prophesied by Bob Jones, who, who saw a green lawn uh, that would be uh, in the, the sanctuary. And so he thought it meant, surely it must be Lawn Street. The church is located on Lawn Street. But it wasn't. It was just an indoor soccer arena that had green turf. <laughs> and for years, we prayed on green astroturf. Prophetic ministry and, and prophetic ministry began to grow in incredible ways there in Kansas City. And so we had Rick Joyner coming in and Jim Gall coming in and Francis Frangipan coming in and Larry Randolph coming in and Paul Kane coming in and, and Bob Jones was there and, and we had Ruben Duran coming in. And I mean, boy, it was like, it was like prophetic Mecca. <laughs> but God had dealt with Mike earlier about prayer. Just like you dealt with Larry Lee about prayer. And he realized something happened in Kansas City. Just like happened with the disciples. The disciples stayed in Jerusalem for too long. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Like, take it from here and go out. And what did the disciples do? They took it from there and stayed in. And so some 30 years after Jesus, Jesus left, they still had not gone out to the world. And so what did God do? He said, then I'm going to scatter you. I'm going to scatter you. And so the disciples got scattered, and that's when the church began to multiply. The people multiplied prior to that, but the church began to multiply. It's like going from 2 times 8 to 8 to the order of ninth power. That's when the church began to multiply. Well, Mike had an encounter in Cairo. Cairo, Egypt, and he was taken to the throne room. 
And the Lord told him, in essence, what you've done so far is what I've called you to do. And so some years later, he's remembering that. And he realizes that we've got to pray more. So we start, we start trying to pray more. We're praying morning, and then Mike says, we're going to pray morning and noon and night. And then we start praying morning, noon, and night, five days a week, then six days a week, and then others make it seven days a week. And so we start praying, and God says, yes, but you're still focused a lot on the prophetic. So guess what? I'm going to scatter you. And then Mike, this is my perspective. If Mike was standing here, I know he'd say, yes, you're right. Because we're still good friends. Um, in fact, we just had lunch together a few months ago. But um, so God allowed persecution to come and scattered the prophetic. And what did that do to Mike? It threw Mike into the hidden room of prayer. And from that, Thousands of prayer groups have started. And Mike hasn't started one, except the one he's in. (laughs) And he started in a mobile home. And it grew. They had detached three mobile homes. And then it grew. And Mike is still in the room of prayer. Let me tell you the thing that's really the miracle here. And I mentioned this to the leaders earlier, but here's the real miracle. The real miracle is not that God's doing a lot of prayer there. That's, that's a miracle, but it's not the real miracle. The real miracle is that Mike is doing it. You see, I know Mike Bickle. Mike is probably the most gregarious man I've ever met in my life. He is the most extroverted man I've ever met in my life. You know what an extro- extrovert is? An extrovert is a, somebody says, I've got 10 minutes, who can I see? <laughs> this is Mike Bickle. An introvert is, I've got, I've got an hour, how can I rest? <laughs> I'm an introvert, Mike's an extrovert. Truly, I am an introvert. Mike is truly an extrovert. I come out of hiding, Mike goes into hiding. <laughs> and so God drove Mike the least likely person on the face of the earth to pray. Not that he wanted a prayer. That's not the point. The point is, he took a man who longs to be with people and says, no. And he takes a man who loves to be out in the midst of the public and travel and says, no. And that man said, yes, I will hide That is the greater miracle than the thousands of IHOPs or houses of prayer. And those of you that lead prayer groups know how hard that is. When you, your mind is blank and you're still trying to pray, When you have prayed for days, weeks, months, years, and all you can look back behind you and see is a furrow, a plowed ground, but not one head of wheat. And you're believing God will bring the wheat. That's a miracle. That's one man who prays. That's turned into thousands who pray. Well, Daniel was like that. See, Daniel wasn't out to say, how many people can I gather to prayer? He, to pray? He was out to say, I'm going to pray no matter what because I have something I've got to do. And he says it like this in Daniel chapter 9. He says, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the prophecy of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. 
Now, at this particular time, there were three prophetic voices living simultaneously. You've got Jeremiah, who is still alive. You've got Ezekiel, who is alive, and Daniel, who is a young man, but still obviously alive. Jeremiah is alive, and he's about 64 years old when Jerusalem is invaded. He dies five years later at the age of 69 in exile in Egypt. Ezekiel is still alive at this time. He's 36 years of age when Jerusalem is invaded. And he dies 27 years later at, at about the age of 63. Daniel is taken at about 16 years of age, and he's 35 when, uh, years old when Jerusalem is invaded. So Ezekiel and Daniel are only about a year apart in their age. He dies 55 years later at about the age of 90. Daniel realizes that there is this prophecy that needs to come true or to come to pass and that God's going to fulfill it. And he recognizes it because he reads the prophecy. And you'll find that in Jeremiah 29 and Jeremiah 25. So Daniel realizes this from Jeremiah's prophecy. So this, this prophetic impetus causes Daniel to pray even more fervently. Once he recognizes this, it's going to happen. So what happens when Daniel starts to do this? When you put the timeline together, it's just a few months after Daniel says, I've got to have a greater amount of prayer, that Daria says, I'm going to throw you in the lion's den. So what was the devil trying to do? Stop the prayer of Daniel that the prophecy of Jeremiah would come to pass. So this Darius wasn't exactly a nice guy at first. He gets nice later, kind of like Nebuchadnezzar gets nice later. But all the things he did beforehand were not nice. Throwing guys in a fiery furnace, you know, all the stuff is not nice. And Daniel says this, this is the worst thing that could have happened to Israel. Under the whole of heaven, never has anything like this happened. And he recognized that this captivity was to set the land to rest in Daniel 9.10. We've not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. The sanctuary, the place where all of this was supposed to be the, the epicenter, the place of prayer, the place of the presence of God, it is desolate. It lies in ruins. And the whole focus of Daniel 9 is the prayer for one thing to happen, the sanctuary to be rebuilt. Because if the sanctuary is not rebuilt, the people don't return. And if the people don't return, the promises that God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob concerning the land, concerning their descendants, could not take place. And the word of God would go unfulfilled, and God would appear to be a liar to the, to the world, to the, to the pagans, and Daniel longed for God not to be seen as that, and therefore for the presence of God to come once again to his sanctuary, to his temple. Well, before we go on with that part, we need to back up a little bit. The temple or sanctuary, Cyrus orders it to be re rebuilt in 538 BC, or about 48 years into captivity. So Daniel's somewhere around 54, 55 years of age right now when that, when that happens. So construction begins because Cyrus was moved on by the Lord, prophesied by God that he would come, and he, and he orders the, the reconstruction of the temple. He orders the decree in 536 B.C., and it begins to be rebuilt two years later after gathering all the materials in 538. Okay, or, I'm sorry, vice versa, 538 and then be built in 536. So then two years out later, its construction stops. Two years into the process, the construction stops. Why? Because of murmuring and complaining and grumbling amongst the people. So two years later, 48 years plus two, 50 years. What should have been a year of jubilee 
turned into a year of the opposite because of the people. So Jubilee was not granted by God. God stops the construction because of opposition. And God foreknew this as part of the 70 years of captivity. So the building resumes then 14 years later in 520 B.C. It's finished four years later in 516 B.C. But the rest of the story is what's really important here. And it's really more important than the finishing of the tabernacle or the, te the temple. Because this is why you're here. This is what drove Daniel. This could well be a driving force in you. Seventy years from 586 B.C. to 516 B.C had been completed. But what about the time frame? Daniel 1, we're given keys to the time frame. Daniel 1 says this, Daniel, I'm sorry, Daniel 9, verse 1. Daniel 9, verse 1 says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Antharis, the lineage of the Medes, typically known as Darius the Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. So we know Daniel began to realize something in the first year of the reign of Darius. 9-2, verse 2, chapter 9. In the first year of his reign, Darius, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. So, first year of Darius is vital to the timeline. First year of Darius. It would take 70 years to accomplish the charge of the people, that's why Jeremiah told him, go ahead and plant vineyards, have babies, start businesses. And, you know, that one of the prophetic voices stood up and said, this is not the word of the Lord, slaps him in the face. And, and Jeremiah says, within a year, you'll die. You'll die running from the enemy, hiding in your closet. And he, Daniel 9, 17. Daniel's praying. We find the impetus for the prayer. Now, therefore, God, hear the prayer of your servant and his, and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. The temple must be finished is the impetus for Daniel's prayer. The rest of it is repentance. Surely nothing like this has ever happened to man. Surely we have not obeyed the voice of the servants, the prophets. Surely we have not obeyed your law. Surely we have not done these things. And by the way, all of those things can be found literally prophesied in Leviticus 26. Exactly what happened to Israel, word for word, is found in Leviticus 26. So he understood that the power of prayer was the very thing that would move the heart of God. Daniel 9, verse 3, says this. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. In other words, whatever it's going to take to get the sanctuary rebuilt, I am willing and I will pay the price to do it. I don't know how long it will take, but I am going to do it. Daniel understood the problem that Jeremiah was prophesying about. So he set his heart to pray and humble himself. Supplication, the Hebrew word for supplication literally means to bend or stoop over in inferiority before one who is greatly superior to you. Fasting means to literally cover the mouth. So he let nothing go in his mouth. Then it also means he let nothing come out his mouth. Sackcloth, to uh, means coarse cloth for bagging grain, and it represents humility. Ashes, to scatter, to totally cover. To, it's an alkaline condition that you put because you are full of sores. In other words, I am nothing but infection to your plan, what you want to do. I am an infection to what you want to do. You put ashes on you to kill that infection. That's what sackcloth and ashes is all about. It's not just a place of humility. It literally is saying to God, I am an infection to your purpose. 
Cleanse me from my unrighteousness. Sanctify me totally, completely. I am not doing what you want me to do. And you throw ashes over yourself to kill the infection. The protocol of Daniel's prayer, found in verse 4. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O God, Lord God, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. Then in Daniel 9, verses 5 through 8, he acknowledges God's great attributes. Tells him how everything he knows about him. Tells God, yes, I recognize who you are. And he's in essence saying, and I'm not you. And in that process, he also voices the seven deadly sins that Israel committed. He voices their iniquity. He voices that they embraced wickedness. He voices that they rebelled. He voices they've ignored the precepts of the law. He voices that they've ignored the injustice that has been happening to God's people. He voices that they've not listened to the prophets. He voices that they've been unfaithful to God. And he does that in Daniel chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. And then he seeks God's forgiveness. And he says, we're going to turn from our iniquity. And we're going to seek to understand truth. Then he seeks God's forgiveness. In Daniel, in verses 15 through 19, he seeks God's forgiveness and he beseeches God for five things in beseeching him for that forgiveness. He beseeches God to hear. He beseeches God to forgive. He beseeches God to listen. And that word listen means to perk up your ears. In other words, your ears have drooped down. It's like, you ever see a dog who pays attention to you and his ears go boing? Not that God's a dog, but it's that perking up of the ears. So listen, and then to take action. Take action. Act, oh God. Don't just listen to me. Take action on what I'm praying. And then he says, don't delay your action. Don't defer it. Don't detour it. Don't delay it. Do it now. Five things that he asked God to do. Here's what we've sinned. Here's how we repent. Now I ask you to do. Not one of those things was for himself. And not one did he sneak in, sneak in a word that says, oh, by the way, Darius has not been nice to me lately. And those governors, by the way, they're really a pain in my rear end. <laughs> not once. It's all about something far greater than he has any ability to make happen. What was the initial result of Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9? We find it, a little hint of it, in Daniel 11. In Daniel 11, Gabriel, the angel, comes and says to Daniel, In the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. This is about the time he's throwing Daniel in the lion's den. When the governor said, hey, that guy, Daniel, you said that if anybody prays to another God other than you, you throw him in the lion's den, Daniel did it, now do it. According to the law of the Medes and the Persians, you cannot alter this. Darius had to throw him in. And Gabriel says, and oh, by the way, when he was being so mean to you, I strengthened him. <laughs> now, how, you, what are you going to say if somebody says that about, about you, your boss? Somebody who's over you. Well, I came, I strengthened him. Well, why'd you strengthen him? You strengthened him so he could throw me in the pit? No, 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 I didn't strengthen him for that. I strengthened him for something else. What did you strengthen him for? I strengthened him so he could make a decision. A decision? Yeah. What decision? Well, we find out later, but I'll give you a hint now. Because it was in the first year that he orders the rebuilding of the temple. Had Daniel, when did Daniel pray? First year. What did Gabriel do in the first year? Strengthen him. Strengthen the king. Did, did God say, oh, Daniel, by the way, I'm sending Gabriel to strengthen the king right now? No. Years later, 
Gabriel comes in and oh, by the way, years ago, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I strengthened him. Then why is that important to you? Because you're going to pray, and you're going to think nothing is happening. But God has sent an angel to bring about your prayer. The problem is you don't know it. And in that unknowing, you think God's not acting. In that unknowing, you think nothing has happened. God hasn't heard. God must not like you. You must have done something that's really, really bad, because if not, God would have surely answered your faithfulness. <laughs> so Gabriel comes to talk to him and says, the process has already started, Daniel. Did Daniel know what was happening? No. So in Ezra, chapter 4, verse 24, it says this. The work of the house of God, the sanctuary, which is at Jerusalem, ceased and was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius. You say, well, John Paul, you said the first year. Yes. First year, he issues the command. They spend time getting all the materials together. They send a group of people, the 1,800-mile process, up the Euphrates, along the Fertile Crescent, along the border of southern mountains of Turkey, down into the Golan Heights, through Damascus, through the Golan Heights, into Israel, then into Jerusalem. And it takes about a year for that to happen. So it discontinued into the second year of Darius the king of Persia, meaning it started the second year, but they gathered the materials immediately. All because Daniel prayed. So why did the temple begin again after 14 years of nothing? Being built for two years, 14 years of nothing, because one man prayed. Daniel countered the seven sins with seven specific prayers. He acknowledges God's attributes and greatness. He repents of failure. He recognizes that what they're experiencing is the consequences of their actions and God's omnipotence. He asked God to remember his name and act according to his name. He asked for mercy and grace. And you know what? That same, so same seven things can be applied to you because you are the temple of God. Some of you may feel like God has quit building you. Maybe you have children that you feel like God has quit building Maybe you have family members that you're afraid God has quit building. But prayer causes God to act on the behalf of another. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that God's spirit dwells in you? Seventy years to change the hearts of the people. There are promises that God wants to fulfill for you, for me. The temple represents the increased presence of God in your life and in your region, certainly in your church and family. Temples are places of God's presence. Temples are places that move God's people. Temples are places of God's power. Temples are places where God's people came together for divine synergy Dedication, relationship, training, and spiritual sustenance. God is simply waiting for us to ask him to restore his temple. And if we do that, there will be moves of God. Not just a move, moves of God. I close by saying this. The New Age has stolen something from us. From us, it's called the law of attraction. 
The law of attraction really is a biblical principle. They've just taken God out of it. They quote Mark 11, 22 through 25 and say that if you, whatever you ask for, you ask the universe for, if you pray, uh, ask, believe, receive, you'll have. So you mean you got to believe it and receive it before you even have it? Yes. And so they take that, they distort it, they twist it, but here's what they leave out. They leave out the first four words of that verse, 11, have faith in God. And they say, have faith in the universe. But it says, have faith in God. Now, why is this important to you? Because here's the, here's the simple truth of the law of attraction. It's based on the atomic structure. The atomic structure is basically this. It is 99.999% empty space. If the nucleus of an atom was the size of our sun, the nearest orbiting electron would be where Pluto is. So the atom is less dense than our solar system in ratio to size. How do atoms work? How, if they're 99.999% of the space, why aren't you falling to the floor? Because that pew is made out of atoms. And your clothing is made out of atoms. Your pen that you're writing on, your phone you're holding, is made out of an atom. Atoms. So why aren't they falling apart? They're not falling apart for one simple reason. is something called the atomic relationship. It used to be called the atomic bond, but it's really the atomic relationship. What in its simplest form is the atomic relationship, which, by the way, the atom is the substance of all creation. The, the simplicity of it is this. The atom sloughs off an electron, creates a negative charge, and attracts another atom that has a positive charge to it, and that they then share the positive electron of each atom. Therefore, the atoms stick together. And the relationship, the sticking, is stronger than the atom itself. And that's why you don't fall to the floor, because of the sticky nature of the negative attracting the positive. Well, you say, well, what does it have to do with me? When you pray, it's not a value statement. When you pray, you create a negative that attracts positive. When you give, why did Jesus say it's better to give than to receive? Because you create this negative. Now, the problem is this. You don't give to get because if you're giving to get, you're not creating a negative. The only way that it works is when you're giving with no idea you're going to get, you're giving so that somebody else can get. You intercede so somebody else will benefit. Amen. It is the difference between devotional prayer and intercessory prayer. Devotional prayer says, help me, O Lord. And that has a place, don't get me wrong. But intercessory prayer is help them, O God. And you're saying, I will give my time. You're creating a negative. Not a value statement, like an electrical charge. I give my time, I give my talent, I give my resources. Not for me, I do it for them. And when you do, then it draws the justice of God to you. Justice is where a negative has been given, an attack has been received, an injustice has happened, and God now rushes in with his blessing that's seven times greater <laughs> seven times greater than whatever was taken from you. Prayer changes things. Things you don't even know are there. Things you don't even know are, are happening. Things you don't, you're in a cloud of unknowing, but God's not. You pray because now God is justified in acting. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, would it be that there would be tens of thousands of prayers every day in this DFW area more than there is right now. 
Would it be that there would be 100,000? Would it be that the, if, if, if that would happen, the nation would change in a heartbeat? Yes. Corruptness in our Congress and representatives at whatever level would change. Prayer changes things. And if one man can do it in the book of Daniel, think what hundreds can do. That's why we pray. Father, thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to participate in building your kingdom through prayer. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to change lives by praying prayers you put into our hearts. Thank you for your work in us. Your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I want to pray for you. If you would like to have a fresh impetus in prayer and a fresh understanding your prayer can make a difference like Daniel's, I want to pray for you. I think it might be too many to come down here, but if you just stand where you are, I want to pray for you. Abba Yehovah, in the name of Yeshua Mashiach, Ben Eli, the Son of God, I pray that what we read in your word today would fall and make root in the heart of all who are here. You see what their desire is. You know why they're here. You know why they've embarked on this journey of prayer. You know what, what their desire is to see and effect the kingdom here on earth change that the hearts of men would fall under the power of the conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment, that you, O oh God, would be all in all, that your name would be lifted up, and that, that the whole earth would be covered, filled, saturated with your glory. It's impossible for us to do, but it's not impossible for you. I pray, Father, that the same passion, the same fervency that you placed in the heart of Daniel, you would place in the heart of every one of these individuals. That they would not give up. That no matter whether they see something happen or don't, they know you act on prayer. They know that you will send angels and be act on prayer. They know you will move the heart of a king because of prayer. They know that you will build and restore and raise up a people that are willing to work because of prayer. They know that nations will change because of prayer. They know that their families will be different because of prayer. They know that your spirit will permeate cities because of prayer. And may this become a driving force. And may they do so like Daniel, not with condemnation, but with conviction, with passion, with fervency, with effectiveness, with righteousness, O oh God. That your name would be all in all. That the name of Jesus would be so predominant, every knee would bow, every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. All above earth, all on earth, all under the earth, all things visible, all things invisible, that will be the day. May prophecy and intercession grow hand in hand even more. May we see what we need to pray for with greater clarity, with greater detail, with greater purpose. And may that be a driving force because we know that which has not will come to be. It will happen. It will take place. Though it is not today, it will be tomorrow. May our prayers release the future. And may your future propel the kingdom of heaven on earth. Fall upon these people. Charge these people. Regenerate this people. May it spread. May it be like a holy infection that spreads to others for your glory and your great 
name's sake, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.